welcome to our devotion again today and uh, we're going to be wrapping up this beautiful psalm psalm 25 we've been looking at the psalm uh, and said that it's it follows a similar pattern to that of one peter where peter reminds us of how we can endure trials especially in the in that instance when we do what is right uh, and yet here in psalm 25 uh, this is clearly a psalm that speaks of David who, who didn't do what is right, probably uh, reflecting on his adultery with Bathsheba. And we raise the question, what do you do when you face trials and difficulties uh, as a result of you doing wrong, as a result of your own sin or your failure or your choices and so on? And we have made a number of statements. First of all, that as believers, we, we face trials and difficulties in our lives. Uh, secondly, many of those trials are as a result of our own failure and sin. And thirdly, that when we face those trials, we need to seek God's counsel. We need to seek God's wisdom uh, to, to get through that trial. And uh, uh, one of the things that we do when we seek God, and we said yesterday, is that we need to confess our sin and uh, seek his forgiveness and uh, of course the promise is that if we if we clean before God and we acknowledge our sin he is faithful and will forgive us the second thing comes from the opening seven verses and I just want to read them quickly because you know we it was a long reading we had the other day and I, I'm sure we don't remember it all but you can hopefully look at it yourself uh, David says in you Lord my God I put my trust I trust in you, do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come to those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord, teach me your path, guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. So the first way to seek God, as we said, is to confess our sin. The second thing that David does here is to recall and affirm God's attributes. And so after this initial prayer, he pauses to remember who the Lord is. So when we're going through difficult times, it's often a good thing to, to pause and to ponder upon the attributes of God. I mean, elsewhere, the psalmist, for example, declares that his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. That encourages us to persevere in difficult times. The psalm is just so filled with references to God's attributes. God is, and I'm not going to read all of them, but God is faithful and trustworthy in verse 1 and 3. Because no one who puts their hope in him will ever be put to shame. God is true, verse 5 and 10. He is saviour, verse 5. He is merciful and loving, verse 6. He is good and upright, verse 8. He is just, verse 9. He is forgiving, verse 11. He reveals his truth to those who fear him, verse 14. He is gracious and comforts the lonely, verse 16. He is powerful to rescue his people from their afflictions. Verse 17, 18, 20. He will deliver his chosen people from all their troubles. Verse 22. I really want to encourage you that when you pray, so often we say we don't really have the words to pray and we don't know what to pray. But the first part of prayer is adoration. And so many folk begin straight away by bringing their petitions to God. And what we need to do is bring our adoration to God. And this is exactly what David does. There's no, there's no better way to bring adoration to God than, than just proclaiming his attributes one after the other. And just to say, Lord, you are trustworthy and faithful. Lord, you, you are true. You are saving. You are merciful and loving. You are good and upright. You are just, Lord. You are forgiving. You reveal yourself to, to those who fear you. You are gracious. You comfort us. And, and you just pray those attributes uh, that you would get from a psalm like this. And so no one can really say, well, I can't pray and I don't know what to say when I, when I pray. Folks, the psalms are full of the attributes of God and we need to, 
to to just extol God. I love that word, extol God by declaring his attributes. And these are just a sampling in the psalm of what God's attributes are. And uh, and that's why um, he encourages us so he, to, to, to seek God in prayer. We must be teachable and willing to walk in his ways. Throughout the psalm, David asks God to teach him his ways or paths. Verse 4, 5, 8 to 10, 12, 14. The Hebrew word for path is... Is, is similar to the word that is used of a rut that is made by a wagon a wheel on a road. God is consistent in his path or his ways, which stem from his holy nature. And as we've been saying in our current sermon series on, on Jesus, our teacher, if we accept God as our teacher, we need to believe that he knows what he's talking about. And we need to obey what he says and walk in his ways. The assurance we have in this particular psalm comes in in verse 8 good and upright is the lord therefore the he instructs sinners in his ways i think that's the key he instructs sinners in his way ways this means as steve cole says that we 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 all qualify there's no one who can say they don't qualify he instructs sinners in their ways not the righteous the sinners just like jesus didn't come for the righteous he came for the, the sinner and so what does it mean to walk in his ways based on what david says in the psalm well first prayer when you think about it this entire psalm is a prayer second it means to wait on the lord verse verse three uh, no one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame but shame will come to those who are treacherous uh, verse five uh, he says guide me in your truth and teach me your Teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. There's a sense of just waiting on God because His timing is always uh, right, and it's not our timing. Third, as we've mentioned earlier, it means being teachable, to grow in our understanding of God's Word. That's why David says, teach me, teach me. You can't be taught if you're not teachable. And so David says, Lord, teach me. Fourth, it means to be humble. Uh, verse verse 9 he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way uh, we saw this remember in james 4 6 where james says god gives grace to the humble and then fifthly it means to obey him in verse 10 for all the ways of the lord are loving and faithful towards those who keep the demands of his covenant those who are obedient Six, it means to fear him, verse 12 and 14, that those who, who fear him. Uh, so David writes, who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways that they should choose. Then seven, it means to look for the Lord continually in verse 15, where David writes, my eyes are forever on the Lord. For only he will release my feet from the snare. My eyes are forever on the Lord to seek and look to the Lord continually. And lastly, it means walking with integrity and uprightness. Uh, verse 21, may integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope, Lord, is in you. What? Yeah, we could, you could preach an entire message on those few verses. Uh, Let's just go through them quickly again. It means prayer. It means to wait on the Lord. It means being teachable to grow in your understanding of God's truth. Four, it means to be humble. Five, it means to obey. Six, it means to fear Him. Seven, it means to look to Him continually. And lastly, it means to walk with integrity and uprightness. Throughout the psalm, David mentions the attributes of God and he declares his trust in God. It is this trust which is behind David's repeated cry for God uh, not to let him be put to shame. Now, why would David be so concerned about not being put to shame? Is this merely pride on his part? Is this to try and protect his ego? No, not at all. There's a wonderful story that I shared with our leaders a few nights ago in 2 Kings 19 of King Hezekiah, who faces the Assyrian army under King 
Sennacherib. And Hezekiah discards his royal robes and dons on uh, sackcloth, the, the, the dress for the distraught and the devastated. And he goes into the temple to bring his petition before God. And what does he say to God in verse 19? Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. Not only did he turn to God, which speaks of humility, but he did so to preserve the name of his Lord. Okay. Likewise, in the psalm, David has declared his trust in God publicly. And not only is his reputation on the line, but also that of the Lord's. If the Lord lets him down, then David's enemies will triumph over him. Both David and his Lord's honor are here at stake. He trusted the Lord. And so others would scoff at him if it didn't come to pass and he wasn't delivered. They would say, well, he trusted in the Lord. What fool does that? And look where it's got him. And so David's appeal in the prayer is, Lord, I'm trusting you for this. You know, be there for me. Come through for me. Don't let me be put to shame. Because if I'm ashamed, it'll bring shame and dishonor on your name as well. Let's move on to the last statement around this psalm. We've seen, you know, believers face trials. We often face trials because of our own sin and failure. We need to seek God and his wisdom in times of trial. And then number four and lastly, no matter how difficult our trials, the Lord is able to deliver us from them for his glory and for our good. And we spend a lot of time looking at this when we looked at 1 Peter 4. And so I don't want to say too much here. Suffice to say God is able to deliver us, but he does not always do so. There may be various reasons for that. And we covered some of those uh, in, in that series on Peter. But as we've said many times before, as believers, God's promise is not to, to prevent difficulties or trials coming our way. Our duty is to affirm by faith, as David does here, that the Lord is always good, that he's always loving, that he's compassionate, that he's able to deliver, deliver us from our trials, even if we were the cause of them, because of our own sin or stupidity. If we humble ourselves, if we seek him, if we call out for his wisdom, he will instruct us sinners that we know his wisdom and he can guide us out of those and through those trials. Our difficult circumstances, friends, should drive us to examine our hearts before God, should drive us to confess and forsake all known sin, and should drive us to cry out to the Lord for his deliverance, all for his glory and ultimately for our good. May God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray for anyone who's just going through a difficulty, a trial right now. Anyone who's just facing difficult times, even if it's because of their own poor decision making, even if it's because of choices they've made or because of blatant sin in their life. Lord, I pray that this psalm would be a comfort to them, that they would heed the words of David, that they would confess their sin to you, that they would remember your, your attributes, Lord, and, and remember what you have done for them and turn to you in this time of trial and seek your wisdom. And so I really just pray that you would uh, just help us through whatever difficulty we might be going through right now, that our eyes would be upon you and that we would continually uh, keep our eyes uh, fixed on, on you as the author and the finisher of our faith. And so thank you for David's words, for, for what he went through. There can be a comfort to us as well. And so bless us as we go into the rest of this day. Uh, just go before us, we ask, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, have a great weekend and we'll catch up with you next week. Uh, God bless you all.